weaving is kind of there's like a spirituality to it <laughs> um i i very much feel like you know <laughs> to dive right into the spirituality of it all that we we are the universe experiencing itself and so when i sit in front of my loom i feel like i am the universe putting itself into order um and so i really love sitting at the loom as like a spiritual practice hello and welcome to the new york guild of hand weavers member spotlight my name is katie clements and i'm the membership chair of the guild with almost 200 members, the New York Guild of Hand Weavers provides inspiration, information, and mutual support to anyone interested in weaving, tapestry, spinning, or fiber arts through speakers, workshops, as well as our lending library. Go to nyhandweavers.org for more information. Today, we will talk with New York Guild member Anthony Dorenzo. Anthony lives in Brooklyn. He's been fascinated by fiber arts since a classmate taught him how to knit in college. He is a spinner, weaver, knitter, and a dyer. He works as the Montessori middle school teacher and will one day have a fiber and dye farm. You can see his fiber art on his Instagram, at Hedl and Canal, and his website, anthonydorenzo.com. So welcome, Anthony. Hi, thank you for having me. My pleasure. Looking forward to this. Let's hear a bit about yourself and your background and how you got started in fiber art. Sure. Um, well, in 2005, when I was a freshman in college, a friend of mine said, if you come to the local knitting store with me, I'll teach you how to knit. Um, and so this was in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and I walked with her downtown. We picked up some yarn. She taught me how to knit, and I thought it was the coolest thing that I had ever learned. Um, and then I couldn't stop knitting all through college. Um, afterwards, um, I moved back with my parents for a few years, and there was a local yarn shop called In the Loop in Norfolk, Massachusetts. And Cheryl, the owner there, sort of showed me how to follow a pattern and pick a project. Um, and so I gained a lot more confidence working with her. Um, but then I wanted to know more. <laughs> and so I ended up taking a learn how to spin yarn class. Um, and that was at Slater Mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, um, which quickly led to me owning my first wheel, a Kromsky Sonata that I still have in love. <laughs> um, and so I was spinning and knitting, and then eventually um, weaving came into the picture in about 2015. Um, I remember that Pearl Soho had published their first weaving pattern for the field scarf, and I thought it was so beautiful I had to make it. So I spent hours and hours and hours researching looms and weaving and what it would take. Um, and so I ended up making that scarf and I gave it to my mom. Um, and then from there, I ended up getting a rigid heddle loom I wove on that for a few years, and then I took a class on multi-shaft weaving at the Textile Arts Center, um, and that was with Kira Silver, who's still there, um, and I <laughs> and a few other classmates were already looking online for used looms halfway through the first hour of the class, because we we just knew. We knew. Um, and from there, I, I got interested in dyeing, and I just really love going farther back into the process to learn, like, what does it take to get to this point, and, and how can I learn new things to have more of my hand in this work. And what about each um, craft clicked with you, like knitting and then spinning and weaving and dyeing? Like... Um, I think for knitting, um, it was just taking this line, this yarn and, and turning it into something really wonderful. Um, that was really cool to see. Um, and then for spinning, um, I really loved how the like chaos of the wool when it goes into the drafting zone just becomes something usable. Um, and that kind of feels like magic. For weaving, gosh, um, weaving is kind of, there's like a spirituality to it. <laughs> um, I, I very much feel like, you know, <laughs> to dive right into the spirituality of it all, that we're, we are the universe experiencing itself. And so when I sit in front of my loom, I feel like I am the universe putting itself into order. Um, and so I really love sitting at the loom as like a spiritual practice. Um, and then dying just feels like magic. Um, <laughs> when you put something into an indigo vat, it comes out bright green and then it oxidizes into that beautiful indigo blue. Um, just, I, I can't believe that happens every time. And every time I think it's not going to happen, it's, it's not going to happen this time. And it does. Uh, so, um, as per your intro introduction, uh, you're a Montessori teacher. I am. I teach Montessori middle school. Um, and I've been teaching, uh, at a Montessori school for eight years and I've been teaching for 13. Um, 
it's really wonderful. I love it. I love the holistic approach. I love showing how everything's connected um, to the students, everything they're learning in their classes. Um, I love the philosophy of, of peace education and cosmic education and understanding how we all fit into the universe's story. Um, I could go on and on and on about it, but um, part Let's of what I, some more, I, I was so interesting. Uh, Montessori teachers actually have to go through a special training um, because Maria Montessori wanted teachers to be prepared. And so she spent her whole life training teachers. Um, so there are still teacher training programs. And I spent two summers in Cincinnati um, learning how to be a Montessori teacher. And I have since gone back to also start teaching um, and helping other Montessori teachers figure out how they're going to better their practice. Um, even just yesterday, I was at a school up in Daramascata, Maine, um, meeting with a teacher who's going through the training to observe her, give her feedback, and come up with next steps. Um, so the like holistic approach to the adult is also really meaningful to me, so that we can also bring that to the kids. Now, ha having been a student of knitting, spinning, dyeing, and weaving, does it help inform your teaching? Um, <clears throat> in that, I am encouraged to sort of model for the students how I am curious about the world. Um, and the way I'm curious about the world is through fiber. Uh, and so I have a lot of license to sort of bring that into my classroom. Um, so I have taught natural dyeing for an intercession with the students. Um, I have taught um, drop spindle spinning with some of our lower elementary students. Um, and right now I'm actually super excited because we received a grant from the Shaft Loom Company for the, from their Tools for Schools grant. Um, so we now have 12 rigid heddle looms and the students are working on a project where they are dyeing the wool um, and then they're going to design a scarf. So they're going to learn a little bit of chemistry with the dye, a little bit of math with the designing the scarf, the mindfulness of weaving in that repetitive motion, and then also feeling proud of your handiwork and your accomplishments. Um, and then we're going to be donating the scarves to organizations that help um, homeless people in New York City. Ah, oh, so meaningful. I love it. Yeah. Uh, what do you see go on in the kids' minds as you're imparting these crafts to them? Um, I see a lot of wonder. Um, I like to present all of this with a lot of um, questions about where the textiles and their life come from. So everything from looking at the tags on our shirts to um, looking at videos of people who are doing this craft all around the world. So we've been watching a lot of videos from indigo dyers in Japan to cochineal farmers in Mexico. Um, there's a great show on Netflix where three comedians go to an indigo farm and they sort of make a mess of it, but also it's honoring the, the cultural crafts that is indigo dyeing for that country. Um, so getting the kids really excited about the material um, is, is hard because, you know, some kids here weaving and they think it's an art and they already are, start from a place of no. So getting them into this growth mindset that, yes, this is something I can do. This is something I can enjoy. This is something meaningful and you might not do it for life, that's fine, but you're you're gonna make one scarf with me. Well, shifting to your uh, being a New York City citizen, mm -hmm. um, do you have workspace challenges as a fiber artist uh, in New York City? And how do you deal with those challenges? Um, I certainly have had challenges. Um, during the pandemic, I was living in a 200 square foot studio apartment. Um, and in that apartment, I had my bed, I had my, 45 inch floor loom. I had my 24 inch table loom and my dresser. <laughs> I love it. Um, and it, it to con con connect it again to the Montessori education, um, you know, the idea of the prepared environment is really important for Montessori teachers because you're creating the environment that the students are going to learn in. And so if I want an environment that I'm going to create textiles in, I actually need to make sure that there's space in that, in that very small apartment for that to happen. Um, Although there were so many difficult things about lockdown, having those two looms there and my spinning wheel there um, in that very small apartment was was super helpful in terms of just me staying grounded and, and as grounded as I could stay <laughs> during that difficult time. I have since moved. Um, I moved to, um, to Kensington in Brooklyn. So I have actually a studio space now. Uh, my partner and I share um, a three bedroom apartment. So we have the, the bedroom and then we each have a studio. He's also a multimedia artist. 
Um, and so to have this like very Virginia Woolf room of my own um, has just been so wonderful because I can come in here and tinker and everything's sort of out of the way when guests come over. Um, but also I've been so lucky, lucky to be in this partnership with my partner who um, is okay when I take over the kitchen to create matter vats and sometimes scouring wool gets a little smelly. Um, so having that, that support at home has been really great too. Um, I think for me, when I'm planning a weaving project, before I got really into dyeing, I would spend hours just looking at colors of different yarns and just imagining what they would look like. And it it just became, a, I became a little overly fussy about it. Um, and so when I'm dyeing, although, you know, you can control for things like water pH and the weights of everything, it's still a little bit of a gamble of what's going to come out of that pot. Um, so I kind of like that I've released that control of what exact color I'm going to get. And it's sort of like the beauty of just having to work with what you have, um, by the end of the dye process. Um, I will say that, you know, my first dye projects, um, didn't always have yarn that held on to color. Um, so it's a lot of trial and error and take note taking. So again, it's that like diving in and observing and learning from doing that I really love about dyeing. I I just think it gets to that um that repetitive motion that can feel really mindful. Um and also thinking of our hands as like these evolutionary marvels. Like I can't believe we have these as as our tools. Um, and so it's like pinch the fiber and draft the fiber and um, everything from even fixing the spinning wheel just feels like such a feat of like human evolution um, because we are able to use these remarkable tools that we were given to um, create textiles. Um, so taking this like chaos again of like the sheep fluff, putting it into the drafting zone, making yarn that is usable and you can knit with it and you can weave with it. Um, it, it, it just feels like I'm even more proud of what I made. Um, and I let people know too. So if they say, oh, I love your hat, they're not even done asking the question. And I say, oh my gosh, thank you. I spun the wool for it too. Um, <laughs> Good. Good to hear you do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just that that extra sense of pride that comes along with um, something you make from your own hand spun yarn is, is how I would convince you, a non-spinner, to try out spinning. Well, that to hear, you're like a conduit for order. <laughs> right. I guess first as a spinner, when you spin, you make so much yarn. And if you are only knitting with it, it takes a long time to knit that. So in terms of yarn use, you can use your hand spun a lot more quickly. Um, so it, it doesn't quite match the speed at which I can spin yarn, but it is closer than knitting. Um, so I appreciate the sort of economy of use of my beautiful materials. Um, gosh, I love everything about weaving. Um, I love the history of it. and thinking about the way that humans have evolved because we were able to create textiles. I love the tools. I love old looms, new looms, um, those super intense computerized looms that are so intimidating. Uh, <laughs> but I I really think the, the tools we use to create these fabrics are also beauti beautiful in themselves. Um, I love thinking about what, what can I get this loom to do? Um, I think in terms of me thinking about my weaving as art is still very new. And so um, wondering, you know, this is who I am as a weaver now, who am I going to be next year or five years from now? Um, and so I've also started looking at some more historical weavers to think about like how weaving has progressed and to think about where it's going to go in the future. Well, I'd like to hear more about the... Um your transition from maybe what you did when you first started weaving into mm -hmm. more um, art weaving. Would you call mm -hmm. it that? Right. I, I would say I would have considered myself a hobbyist um, a while ago. Now I would consider myself an artist. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with my journey doing the artist's way, um, the program from Julia Cameron. Um, so I started that at the in 2022. Um, and for those who don't know, it's a 12 week program where you're writing three pages of, um, stream of consciousness notes every morning, you go on a weekly artist date with yourself. And there's some other, um, 
so other planned activities that you do throughout the weeks. Um, and it's all about sort of building up your confidence as an artist and also quieting that voice in your head that keeps telling you like, this isn't good enough, or this doesn't look good, or this, you're never going to be a good weaver. So what? Just stop. So um, hearing that voice, telling that voice to shut up and then getting back at the loom and making something beautiful that you can be proud of and you can learn from. That sounds so fortifying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you. Well, who and what do you find inspiring? Um, I think that anybody who makes something with their hands is inspiring. Um, and then if we're thinking specifically about textiles, I'm so inspired by every weaver because I can't weave at all. Um, and so it is amazing to see what other folks are making out there. Um, and so I think part for me, especially coming to the guild meetings that like show and tell when folks are passing things around is like the best because I get to like touch other people's um, textiles and see what they did and and think about what this might look like if I were to try something like that. Um, so I think a lot of it is just talking to, to other folks. Um, in terms of specific people who I find inspiring, um, I would say contemporary weavers would be um, Rachel Snack, um, who runs Weaver House Co. down in Philadelphia. Um, she has really beautiful pieces. She has a gorgeous Instagram. I'm so excited because I signed up to take a class of hers in January. Um, so I'm going to go down to Philadelphia and get to um, learn from her. And um, another weaver who I think is incredible is Astrid Tuber. <laughs> um, she is a spinner and a weaver, and she's 13 years old. <laughs> And she is weaving just yards and yards and yards and yards of beautiful fabrics. And then she takes those fabrics and makes beautiful clothing out of it. And just her output alone is just like mind boggling how she has this dedication to her craft. Um, and to see her and know that she's the same age as my students um, is just like mind boggling. Um, so I've I've always believed in the power of adolescence and seeing someone like her just makes me actually like fully buy into the fact that these are this is an amazing age for for humans. Um, in terms of folks who are no longer weaving, um, I'm getting a lot of inspiration right now from Annie Albers. Um, I've become very interested in Bauhaus. Um, I think her sort of walking that line between weaving as a craft and weaving as an art and how the two can exist in the same piece is really wonderful. Um, I also see a lot of connection between her and Maria Montessori that I'm really interested in exploring more because Maria Montessori opened up all of her schools in Italy and had to shut them down for World War II because she would not work directly with uh, Mussolini's fascist re regime. Annie Albers was at the Bauhaus, which also had to shut down because of what was happening in 1930s Germany and moved uh, her school and all of her stuff to North Carolina. And so I think these these like two powerful women who are doing things that I'm so passionate about that are different have like this sort of similar story is really fascinating. Um, and I've also been reading some of the works of uh, William Morris um, to think about what we lose when we rely solely on mass production and this idea of like humans as crafters and artisans uh, we can get a lot of like joy and purpose from that. And so when we sort of take that artistic beauty out of everyday objects, we lose a lot of that purpose we feel as humans. Um, and so that is also one of my like big draws to this very slow process of creating woven textiles. Do you have a go-to place in the city that just fills your creative gas tank? Oh my gosh. Um, Yes, <laughs> it's care to share. I, I will share. I, it's it's perhaps not the answer you were expecting, but it's Greenwood Cemetery. I, um, I would totally get that. I absolutely love walking around that cemetery. Um, everything from the birds to the monuments to the other people to the landscaping. Um, and just thinking about the amount of thought that went into this space that was used for burying people that could have so easily just been a boring old flat field but it's not it's such a dynamic wonderful thing and it's this place that you know 
people put thought into and putting that much thought into a cemetery makes me think like, oh, we should be putting lots of thought into lots of things we do as humans, um, like textiles. So anything specific that impresses you or inspires you when you look at other fiber artists work, the work itself? First, the marvel that they made it. Um, I, I, I love when people make things and I, I love how proud people are when they are talking about the things they made. Um, for me, and this gets back to turning off that voice in your head, um, one of the things I like to look for, especially as a weaver, when I sort of know what what we are all striving for, is to actually find those like imperfections of the human hand in another weaver's work. Not because not because oh, I'm like trying it. to judge no, them, no. but because it helps me understand that, oh, I have these imperfections in my work too. Yes. And it's still gorgeous. Yes. And in fact, that imperfection almost makes it even more beautiful because it is something that we made with our hands. Yeah. Um, so I actually, I do, I look for those imperfections and I hope that folks at the guild won't stop handing around their, their fabrics knowing that I'm looking for that. Well, I just know for mine, you'll be guaranteed to find something. You know? <laughs> but, but that's what handmade, you know, it's not a machine made. Right. And it'll, it'll make me feel better about your work. And it'll make me feel better about my work too, that I share. Yeah. Okay. Let's do the slideshow. First slide. So this is the very first yarn I, I spun. This was when I was taking the class at the Slater Mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Um, and I actually, I went back to find this photo just a few weeks ago because I was recently on a farm trip with my students and there were sheep on this farm and we got to do fiber work and then there was indigo and we got to do dyeing. And I was just like absolutely in heaven. Um, but I was teaching my students how to spin the wool with one of the farm instructors and the kids kept saying, oh my gosh, Anthony, mine doesn't look like yours. And I said, oh, but my first yarn definitely does. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to show this student, this picture to my students so that they could see not just the yarns I'm creating now, but like the yarns I was making when I was first starting, um, ju just to, so they don't get discouraged. <laughs> um, yeah, it's part of the process. You don't get dropped into you know, high level, <laughs> it has to be built. Right, and I, I absolutely did nothing with this yarn because what can you do with this yarn? Um, and then I ended up losing it to the Great Moth Wars of 2017. Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry to it, hear that. <laughs> thank you, it was it was a tough year, but um, I was glad to have still found this picture. Yes, yeah, that's, that's valuable. Mm -hmm. um, so 2016 is when Pearl Soho had, um, published this pattern for their field scarf. Um, and I wasn't ready to dive in at sort of that price point for that, <laughs> that Pearl Soho pattern, which is gorgeous. Yeah. Um, but I had some yarn in my stash that I just wanted to try making um, a scarf out of. So this weaving on the left um, was intended to be a scarf, but I didn't yet know about take up and draw in. So it is teeny tiny, uh, <laughs> but it is still, uh, I still proudly display it in my classroom as a table runner. Um, and so, you know, the kids will be playing with it and I always get to tell them, Hey, I made that. <laughs> it's beautiful. Thank you. Um, and so on the right is the field scarf. That was my, actually my second weaving project. Um, and so this was, uh, made out of their linen quill yarn, which I believe has linen and perhaps there's a protein fiber in there. Um, and the different color gradations at the end. And so I wove this and then I ended up gifting it to my mom for Christmas that year. It looks beautiful. And I love the uh, warp gradation too. Yeah, there's the the white, the the like marled white and gray and yeah. the, the gray yarn, which is really creates a really lovely effect. Yeah. So for natural dyeing on the, the left pictures, um, that is from a project I did in 2017 um, when I spent a few weeks on an island in Maine. And I walked around the island and found different plants that I could dye with. And so this is the result. And the the yarns and fabric on the top are from Goldenrod, um, which was really exciting to die with because Goldenrod has been the bane of my existence because I am so allergic to it. And so it felt a little bit like I was <laughs> getting a look back at it um, by plucking it a lot of it and using it in my dye bath. Um, but there was also wild mint and rose hips and blackberries um, and blueberries all on the island and Queen Anne's lace. Um, so that was a, that was a sort of big undertaking because I had the time and I was in Maine and I really wanted to try forage dyeing. 
And then on the middle and the right photos, um, this is a yarn that I spun last year. And it was for an article I was writing in Ply Magazine um, about hand spinning yarn. Um, and it's sort of like a meditation on place. And so this is my yarn as a place. And so this wool came from Long Island. Um, so it's about as local as we can get here in Brooklyn. And then right when I was finishing it, my students had just finished presenting their Dia de los Muertos projects. And so they were, had these beautiful ofrendas and, and cardboard um, posters that were just covered in marigolds. And I said, oh my gosh, if you don't want the marigolds, I will take them. And so I got about um, 10 ounces of marigolds from the kids. And then I put them into the dye pot and ended up with this gorgeous yellow yarn um, here in the center. That is beautiful. I, I showed the kids and I, they were so excited. I was so excited. Um, I shared it at the faculty and staff art show. I wrote an article about it. I just, I'm really, really happy with the way that this project ended up. I am still waiting to figure out like what's the perfect way to use this yarn. Um, I'm, I'm worried that it's becoming a little bit like too special in my, my heart that I'm never going to use it. Um, so I, I think I just need to sit down and, and figure out what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. That's pretty. <clears throat> yeah, where is this photo taken? Um, so when I was living in that teeny tiny studio apartment, I didn't do any dyeing in the apartment. Mm -hmm. Um, so my mom who lives in Massachusetts, uh, would let me sort of take over her backyard for a week or two when I was home in the summer. And so this is yarn that it's actually wool from a Montessori colleague of mine who raised, raises sheep down in Virginia. Um, so she sent me a bunch of wool and I carded it and I spun it. Um, and then I dyed it with indigo. Oh. And then it went into these wall hangings that I, the warp in the background yarn um, is yarn that came from the, um, Fab Scrap, the textile recycling uh, place down in Sunset Park. Uh, so I like to volunteer with them a couple times a year. And they always have interesting yarns that I like to try to figure out what I'm going to do with, uh, with yarn that should have been in a landfill, but now it's not because of textile recycling. Where are these uh, wall hangings? Um, the one in the, the leftmost wall hanging, um, is now it, it was sold. Um, so it is hanging in a person's house in Virginia and the one on the right is still hanging in my living room. Beautiful. And how big are these? These are about, I think they're eight inches wide and 12 inches tall. Beautiful. Okay. Here are the, uh, two different studios. So on the left is the, my apartment throughout the pandemic. It lived there from 2019 to 2022. Yeah. And so I am basically standing on my countertop to take this, this photograph um, right there in the kitchen. So you can see my 45 inch Leclerc fanny loom. Um, and then towards the windows, I have my 24 inch Ashford table loom. Um, under the bed is my Kromsky Sonata that's folded up. And so I had a lot of the, the floor plan for this apartment dedicated to fiber arts. And now as I'm looking at this, I can even see I have my knitting project on the nightstand <laughs> next to my bed. Yes, um, so there's there's a lot of, of fiber craft happening in that teeny tiny space. Um, I am so proud of what I did with that space and so glad to be in a bigger sp space now. Yeah. On the right, that is the studio I'm in right now. Um, that also has space so that I don't have to keep my spinning wheel <laughs> folded and locked up. Um, my looms are both readily available and always, uh, I can just sit down and weave on them. I have a, I have a desk now, which is really exciting. Um, and actually here on the left of the photo, you might see that giant spinning wheel. Um, oh. I, I had a student last year come in and he said, Anthony, my mom has some knitting thing. Do you want it? <laughs> and I said, probably, but could you get me a picture <laughs> of it? And so he brought in a picture and I said, yes, I would like that. And so I got this 18th century great wheel um, from a student's mom that with just a little bit of beeswax was up and running. Um, and so I've been practicing my long draw technique, which I um, is still a challenge, um, but that's just when you sort of pull your hand back and let the twist go into the yarn ever so slowly. It's like a dance. Um, 
So I've been been working up my proficiency on that wheel. And thankfully I have the space for it now. I bet though, if you were offered that, you would have found a way to get it into the, <laughs> the other apartment. Right. I'm I'm sure the the dresser or that bookcase could have gone somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> and I see something hanging at the head of your bed. Is that something you made? Oh yes, that's a that's a knitted piece. So that is the Girasol pattern from Brooklyn Tweed um, that I had tried to knit unsuccessfully about seven or eight times, uh, just because it's a pretty intricate lace pattern. Um, and so finally I sat down and I said, I'm going to do it. And I tried six more times and finally figured it out. Um, and so I was so happy to finally knit that. And it's sort of the perfect piece to drape over my, my bed frame. So thinking about that intersection of like weaving as a, as a function and a craft and weaving as an art, um, I think sort of my sweet spot for blending the two is, is shawls and scarves. Uh, because it is very much like wearable art. Here on the left, um, this is actually a piece that is my hand spun yarn. Uh, mm. And then I used a supplemental warp for that sort of like shashiko looking pattern on there. Um, that's a really gorgeous scarf that I love wearing because it is, I think it's silk, yak, and merino. Um, so it's really warm and really soft. Um, in the center here on the top is a shawl that I designed and wove out of um, silk alpaca yarn. Um, and so that's my like very fancy, I'm going to a fancy event. It's middle school graduation or a friend's wedding. So I, I wrap that around me. Um, and that is um, probably the piece I wove that had the most warp ends. I think that was upwards of 900. Um, <laughs> And it, it's a very fine fiddly yarn and it wasn't the easiest weave, um, but sometimes I find that just makes me even prouder of the piece when it's done. Um, the bottom left and the rightmost picture are the same warp with two different uh, shawls that I wove using uh, gradients and the orange is a commercial dyed and then the blue I'm holding there is my hand dyed linen. Um, and then that is me proudly showing it off at Rhinebeck two years ago. Um, so in terms of rep repurposed yarn, I mentioned earlier about um, the uh, fab scrap. Yes. And so these are pieces that I've, I've woven from yarns that I got from fab scrap. Um, and so, gosh, they it is just so fun to go there. Um, you get to sort um, through textile recycling for two and a half hours. Um, the people who work there all have like the best vibe. I brought my students there last spring and it was just incredible. The kids got such a kick out of it, um, holding things up, showing each other what they thought the fabric could be turned into. Um, and then the reuse room, their store that they have there is just so full of possibilities. It's so exciting. Um, so here are two projects that are made fully from fab scrap yarn. Um, the ones on the left, those are bookmarks that I made. Um, though that was my first um, weaving with monk's belt as the pattern. Um, Very cool. And thank you. This was, I believe, 36 EPI, which was the um, sort of finest weaving I've ever done. Um, so these bookmarks are only about two inches wide and six inches long. A lot of design in those few inches. <laughs> yeah. And and it, they took a long time to get there too. Yeah. Um, and then on the right are coasters with the snakeskin design, um, just because that that was the pattern that I was like salivating for an eight shaft loom to weave, because I think it's just so gorgeous. And so this is a, uh, a cotton yarn for the warp. That's that sort of greeny gray. And then the blue and the maroon yarns are um, a wool yarn that I was able to find in their reuse room. Great. Right. And your proportions of the pattern are beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. I love how you style your photos too. Thank you. Um, that is something that I put a lot of time into thinking about how the photos um, of my work show. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of my work and I want it to look good too, um, because I, I know a lot of people only see my work on Instagram. Um, and so I want to make sure that they are also seeing sort of the beauty of of these textiles that I've made. 
Oh, I want to hear about this. <laughs> um, so the the story is that in 2020, I received a travel grant from my school to go to Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, and then I couldn't go to Oaxaca, Mexico in 2020. <laughs> Um, so eventually the um, borders were opened back up, the travel grant money was opened back up. So last spring break, March of this year, um, I was able to go. Um, and so it was like the trip I had been planning for four years. Um, and so I was there for two weeks. And in those two weeks, I, um, I stayed in a hotel in the center of town. Um, I took a three-day weaving class with Tayer Tenido a Mano, or um, hand-dyed workshop, um, with Elsa and Eric Sanchez. That's Elsa Sanchez in the middle of that photo there. Um, and it was so wonderful. We um, arrived there. That's Hannah, the other woman in the photo. Um, she's also a teacher. She's from Canada. Um, so we spent the first day um, preparing our mini skeins of yarn. We got white yarn and gray yarn from churro sheep, um, which are kind of the only sheep that seem to um, survive in Mexico's hot climate. Um, and so we wound the mini skeins mm -hmm. and then we mordanted the fabric and then started with yellows. And for yellow, we used wild marigold and pomegranate skins um, and two separate dye baths. And from there, on to day two, we worked with cochineal, the little bugs that grow on the cactuses down there. Um, and we also played around with the pH level of, um, of the dye baths using lime juice. So we squeezed a whole lot of limes um, and added them to the cochineal bath to shift it from that very pink that cochineal is known to be to a sort of deep red that almost looked more like a matter. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also used uh, Brazil wood that that second day. And then on the third day, we did um, an indigo vat and we did a natural fructose bath. So we were mashing up bananas with our hands and putting them into the vat. Um, and then also used um, indigo that was grown in the isthmus of Mexico, which was so great to use that that local resource. And then we dipped the indigo and dipped a few other colors just to get some of that underdying effect. And then we produced this beautiful rainbow. Oh my God. So is that everyone's yarn lined up? That is, that's what I got to take home. That was my yarn. So Hannah got oh. to go home the exact same, her own, her own beautiful rainbow of, of fabulous Mexican yarns. That's incredible. And so when I came home, I had this yarn and I thought, I can't let this just sit on the shelf. I have to make something. Um, and so I was so inspired by all of the rugs that I saw down in, in Oaxaca. And so I knew I wanted to make a rug. And so I just came up with a few design ideas. I chose one. And then I thought this would celebrate the like rainbow of the, the colors that I came, came home with. And this is, this rug, I believe is 24 inches wide by 36 to 40 inches long. It is proudly hanging on my wall. Um, and I also submitted this last summer for the Arts Gowanus and Brooklyn Pride exhibit, Together We Will, which was a juried exhibit, and they accepted it. And so an image of this rug was hanging at Old Stone Park all summer as part of that exhibit. Um, and so having this, this rug that was so meaningful to me, um, because of this like travel grant that I had worked so hard on and had to wait so long for um, to come home with this beautiful yarn, make this beautiful piece and then be celebrated for that felt really good. Um, ah, well done. Thank you. And then um, in terms of Oaxaca, it is just a wonderful, beautiful, fabulous city filled with arts and um, it, it's almost hard to find like a Oaxaca t-shirt or a Oaxaca shot glass because you, all of the shops are just filled with um, handcrafts from the neighboring towns. And so in the second week I was there, I was lucky to sign up for a class with Oaxaca Cultural Navigator to go into the Tlacolula Valley where the weavers live. Um, and it turns out that Elsa, my weaving teacher, works for Oaxaca Cultural Navigator. And so she was my tour guide. Oh, and so I got to spend another day with her. And we went and saw um, a silk farm in the, the mountains. And then we also saw a weaver who works with 
a lot of experimental dyes and experimental materials. So he showed me his weaves that he had copper in and Ishle, which is the fiber from the um, Nopal cactus. And, and he even had yarns that had been dyed with the snails from the Mexican coast. Um, so there's a tradition in, that I know of from Europe of dyeing snails, dyeing with snails. And so similar, similarly in Mexico, they are able to harvest this like beautiful purple color out of the snail, but it is so labor intensive that he was only able to get just a little bit of yarn that was dyed with that. And it still smells like the ocean, which on one hand is not the most pleasant scent, but on the other hand, it's like the coolest thing ever that this yarn had been dyed with snails from the ocean and still held on to that scent. Um, it was really great to to hold on hold that for just a few moments to to observe and and just understand the the work that went into that. Um, we went to Fe Ilola, which is a rug um, a family that is rug weavers, um, and then there it was great because I saw Fe Ilola. That's the name of the the mom and dad of the the operation. Um, Fe or Federico is a comes from a weaving family and so his routines and his designs are all very traditional and then his wife Dolores Lola started weaving when she met Faye and so she has a very like modern contemporary approach to not following the rules and so what's interesting is that their kids their rugs are kind of a mix of the two it was like seeing like textile genetics at play <laughs> um and then I got a tour of their studio from um, Omar Santiago, who is their son and has also done a bunch of YouTube um, events for the Hand Weavers Guild of America. So I was like a little starstruck getting to meet him. Oh. And then our final stop that day was at a women's collective um, where it was a community of women who wove really beautiful bags um, out of, they would use the traditional rug weaving method and then they would um, sew them up into a bag to sell to support their community. Um, and it was really great to just chat with them. Um, one of the reasons I was able to go on this trip is because I'm also a Spanish teacher at my school. Um, and so getting to this like cultural immersion and the language immersion was, was a huge selling point um, for my professional development. Um, so to chat with these women at this collective in Spanish about language, about teaching, about textiles, about um, life, about everything was was just a really, really wonderful moment. That sounds, knowing the language must really enrich the experience a lot. It, it, it really did. And, you know, I had never merged those worlds together before. So I could speak in Spanish about lots of different topics, but not necessarily textiles. And so taking those three-day classes with Elsa, and then luckily Hannah, my classmate, also spoke Spanish. So we were picking up all of this, this new vocabulary to talk about textiles in Spanish. Um, and so then by the end of that tour day, I feel like I could have spoken for hours about textiles in Spanish. And I, I had done just that. Any plans to go back? Uh, definitely. I will definitely be back in Oaxaca. Um, I think I would love to do a trip starting in Mexico City and then heading to Oaxaca um, just to sort of expand what I know about Mexico. Um, but gosh, there's, there's, it felt like I didn't have enough time there mm. and I'm there for two full weeks. Mm -hmm. um, it just feels like there's still more to explore, more to do. Um, so some things I've been working on um, this summer and this fall have been um, a lot of sort of rug style wall hangings from hand dyed yarns. Um, so the piece on the left is a wedge weaving from some yarns that I dyed, including um, that one has, oh yes, my first foray into saving my onion skins and dyeing with those. <laughs> That's the bright yellow in there, um, as well as I think we have some logwood in there and some, in, uh, some avocado pits in there. Um, the mat on the right um, also has weld and quebracho and some more cochineal and indigo. And then the yarns in the middle here um, is the project that I just finished this past week. Um, these are two different rainbows using two different um, red and yellow dyes, um, just because I wanted to see the different types of colors I could make. Um, so in the top there, we have 
the red is matter, the yellow is, um, the yellow is onion skins, sorry. <laughs> um, and the blue is indigo. And then the bottom rainbow, the, it's not quite red, but what I intended to be red um, is lack. The yellow is Osage, which is a Southern tree that they collected the, the shavings from. And again, I used the blue for the indigo. Um, so there's two very different moods happening here with, with these rainbows that I thought was really exciting. I think one of the reasons that I know you had mentioned that my photos are beautiful, it's because I am so excited to, to have a finished piece um, that I really want to take the time and the care to photograph my pieces so that they pop like this. Um, cause it's my own excitement. I'm so excited to share what I've done, um, with everybody who, who wants to see it and wants to listen. Um, and so, you know, these, these rainbows, I must've photographed in four or five different setups until I got the right one. Uh, so what does being part of a guild mean to you? Um, <clears throat> I had joined the guild a few years ago and then I just never came, <laughs> um, I guess I didn't know what to expect. Um, and so I actually met and talked to Thomas Victor at Vogue Knitting Live last winter. Um, and he convinced me to show up and I did. And I thought it was a really great meeting. Um, the show and tell is like incredible. I love seeing other people talk about what they have made, the problems they faced, how they solve those problems. Um, and then, you know, proudly sharing and showing off what they made. Um, it's it's really inspiring. Um, I ended up taking a lot of notes during that time um, because I am just fascinated by people sharing um, their own processes. Um, the um, presentations have also been really, really wonderful and inspiring. Um, you know, this most recent one, when we heard from the co-curators of the exhibit at the Cooper Hewitt for Dorothea Livis was just absolutely incredible. And I can't wait to go see that exhibit now. Um, and so getting that, um, it's almost like an education. It feels like I'm going to a class that I'm really excited for, um, is, is just a wonderful part of my routine now. Like I am actively looking forward to the next guild meeting. Um, I think for me, because I have such a, sh a social job, I love weaving because there's a solitary aspect to it, um, but that's not the only aspect, right? And so that community that comes at the Guild is something that I'm finding I am really enjoying and something that was lacking before I, I joined. Um, everybody has been so incredibly kind and supportive and enthusiastic. And um, I've just absolutely loved the people that I've chatted with at the Guild and can't wait to go back and chat with them more in October. Um, so it's it's been a really great addition to my own practice to go to these meetings. It always strikes me how individual the works are of each person. And that personal style starts to come out as you get to know people as weavers. And so like when somebody is sharing something for the second time, you can start to see how they may have gotten to there from their previous piece. Yeah. And so I wonder if maybe after a few years of going to the guilds, if if one day you just hold up a piece and we can start telling you who made it. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. Uh, do you ever get discouraged or stuck on a project or unmotivated? And how do you move through that? Oh my gosh, yes. Um, I, I think for me, having all these different disciplines within the fiber arts world is really helpful. So, um, you know, right now I'm, I'm not spinning a whole lot, um, but I am weaving a lot and I am dying a lot. Um, so having other things to go to when I'm feeling a little bit run down in one discipline is really helpful. Um, I think for me also continuing with those morning pages from the artist way. So I still start every day by writing three pages of journals about um, just how I'm feeling about everything in life, but especially my, my art practice. Um, so for me, I mean, do I get discouraged? Yes, of course. I mean, I've set up projects that I realize aren't going to work. And um, part of doing all of this for me is the joy I feel. And so if I'm not feeling joy in doing it, I don't want to do it. So I'm I'm not afraid to just cut something off a loom and start again. Um, 
I don't like doing it, but I'm not afraid to do it. <laughs> um, so I try not to dwell in discouragement. If I can fix it, I will. If I can't, I will. I might take a day or two, but I'll I'll move on. Yeah, that keep moving seems to be an important thing I hear. Right, and again, just centering the joy I feel as a textile artist. Um, if if I don't feel joy, I'm not going to do it. And what would you say to people starting out? Oh, you're a perfect person to ask this because of your uh, you as a teacher. But mm -hmm. and it sounds like you've been turning kids on to fiber art. So what do you say to people? non-students starting out in fiber art um gosh there is so much information out there now um between youtube and instagram and books and magazines i sometimes can find myself just getting lost in all of that um and not actually taking the time to create things um so i guess my my first tip for folks just starting out would be read a little bit of course um but but don't feel like you need to learn everything before you start um because there's just too much to learn um i still am learning and i still get caught you know scrolling the internet for drafts and color theory and yarn tips and all of that um rather than just sitting down and making the thing i want to make um and then also i think for me weaving came last and i i think perhaps some of that is the the sort of initial investment um but that there are so many great online um secondhand sites to find really cheap um pretty good quality fiber tools um when i was just starting out spinning um you know i was always on ebay looking for you know ball winders and nitty noddies and and cards and i i still have my um oh gosh they're right here my antique wool combs that oh. I got on oh, eBay wow. that I still use. Uh, they were way cheaper than buying new ones. So yeah, deals to be had to try it all out because there are so many cool things to do in, in fiber arts. And there are so many fun tools. <laughs> I, I love the tools. <laughs> Uh, so you mentioned uh, Future Fiber and Dye Farm. I'm so curious to hear. Is that something you're open to talking about? It is. Um, here? Thinking about who I am as, as a fiber artist and that journey I go through to like go back farther in the process to say that I had more of a hand in it. Um, I've been thinking a lot lately about, you know, a dye farm and can I grow dye plants and where can I grow dye plants? And also thinking about sheep and goats and alpaca and llama and linen and other things that could grow in this area. Um, this area meaning the Northeast. Um, I don't know that I could have sheep in Brooklyn. Um, so it it's developing a like five-year plan that also matches up when my student loan is fully paid off. Um, so there's sort of like this perfect transition point coming up um, in the next few years and thinking about how I can build something that would still have that educational aspect so that folks are intrigued and, and curious and they have wonderings about about textiles and dyes and things that, you know, are, are our connection with nature and using nature in a sustainable, responsible way. Um, it, it just feels like I have this point in my life coming up and I really want to make something really cool happen. And so I, the, the track I'm going down now in my mind is a fiber and dye farm. That would also be some sort of education center for folks. Oh, it's so exciting. Yeah. I'll still come to guild meetings. <laughs> yeah, it'll be fun to check in at, over some time and uh, see what has progressed. Mm -hmm. So besides that, what's ahead for you in your work? In my work right now, oh, oh gosh, I have just still been dying. Um, I'm doing the big project with the kids right now at school. So that's taking a lot of um, my focus, which I'm not taking. I'm so happy to have that be my focus right now. Um, when that's done, um, I imagine that I will probably find those spinning wheels again and start spinning through the winter. Um, I'm going back to Rhinebeck in two weeks. And so will I buy a fleece or two? 
I don't know. Um, but it, I, I will peak at least. Um, so hoping to just do a lot of more wonderful things with that chaos of wool and turning it into something meaningful and a beautiful material and a beautiful end product. Well, That's well, thank you so much, Anthony. This has been great. Thank you. This was great. <laughs> and thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please like, comment, and share, and subscribe to the New York Guild of Handweavers YouTube channel. If you're interested in joining the New York Guild of Handweavers, please go to nyhandweavers.org. See you in the next video, and until then, happy weaving.